Assembly of God, welcome to you this morning and those of you watching online, welcome this morning to our service this morning as we continue to journey through the book of James. Today, in a, as I was contemplating on the topic of my meditation today, what came to my spirit was, what, was, what, is, the real, what is the goal of our spiritual journey? Think the Spirit of God was questioning me, what is the goal of our spiritual journey? There must be a goal because otherwise, then when we are saved, then we, we, can't, we, just, we can just die immediately. If we are saved, born again, we might just have to die immediately and go to heaven. But if we are still going to be here, there must be some, some reason. Because uh, otherwise we might be unsaved, even though in God's perspective that cannot happen. But if he keeps us here again before we go to heaven, it means he's probably have something for us to do. What is really the ultimate goal of our spiritual uh, journey? And one of the scriptures that came to my mind was the one in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. When it said, and not from verse 13, but chapter 4, he says, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers. pastors and teachers for the edifying of the body of Christ so that he will all come to the unity of the faith and unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. So it showed me something there that spiritual maturity is actually one of the goals if I would not be propensitious to think that is the only goal. But it seems like to be one of the most important goals of our Christian journey is to attain Christian maturity, spiritual maturity. That's what Paul refers there to, to become a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is level. There are levels in Christ. But he wants us to get to the fullness of Christ. So the fundamental question often is this. So how can we measure spiritual maturity? What are some metrics that we can use in determining whether someone is spiritually mature? Is it being in church for all your life? Would that qualify you to be placed under the category of spiritually mature? Or is it because you are serving in church or because you are a pastor that you are spiritually mature? These are some of the ways the world looks at this thing they have. But I guess the, the word of God, they say the wisdom of God is higher than the wisdom of this world. So some of the metrics some of us use because I read the Bible every day, I'm spiritually mature. Because I tithe frequently and I give to missions, I volunteer, I do this, I burn this, I go on missionary trips, I do this. So all of these things, while they are not wrong, they are actually good works, if done with the right motives. They will not properly pro uh, uh, define spiritual maturity. So let's go to the book of James. James guides us to that answer, to the answer to that question. If you're wondering, how can I measure spiritual maturity? What are some metrics to use in determining when so, if someone, if I am spiritually mature? James gives us an answer to that. And it's in the title of my sermon to you this morning. Spiritual maturity is in the tongue. James nails it. It's in the tongue. It's not in the head. <laughs> it's not how many scriptures you know. You know. You know, some people fascinate us when they quote scripture. They can quote all the whole Bible, you know, to you, but they do none of them, okay? <laughs> so, so he says it's in the tongue instead. It's in the tongue. Okay, now you say, well, if somebody's quoting the scripture, isn't he using the tongue? So probably, you know, you know. So let's see what James was really saying here. And in order to understand that, I like to go to the background of the story of the book of James. Okay? You have heard it last Sunday, but those who did were not here last Sunday, or who, are, who didn't listen to me last Sunday, also need to hear it. So James was 
speaking to a specific audience, the Jewish people, many of whom were farmers or peasants, as they were called in that day. These were undergoing immense trials of poverty and oppression from the rich people. The rich were oppressing the poor in the day that James was writing. And the Roman government did not make it easier, didn't make it easier. The government that of the day was actually the one enforcing the oppression and the, the, the oppression over the poor. So what are some examples of the hardships that the, the poor people of the day that Paul uh, James was writing to? What were they facing? They were landless, they had lost their land, they were facing high exorbitant taxes that drove them out of business, uh, and they ended up working for rich people who were exploiting them by the day, withholding their pay, or not paying them a fair wage. And if these poor people tried to fight back, the rich landlords would hire assassins to eliminate them physically, or they would sue them to the courts where they had no fair chance of winning the case, and thereby exacerbating their poverty. So we summarize by saying that there were numerous social and economic tensions going up at that time James was writing this letter. There were numerous social and economic tensions that were going. So what was the essence of James' message? The essence of James' message was, on the one hand, to condemn those who were oppressing and exercising injustice over the poor. That's condemned the rich, the Roman government, and its allies. That is, some Jewish people, rich aristocrats, who were in the church, but were associating with the Roman government to oppress the poor. So James was condemning this group of people who were exercising oppression and injustice. But James also condemned some of the oppressed believers whose response to that oppression and injustice was through violent acts and violent rhetoric. There were some in the church who thought the best way to respond to the injustice was through preaching violence, the doctrine of violence. So if they see a rich aristocrat come into the temple, they should stab him on the back and kill him. You know, they were responding an eye for an eye uh, by through violent acts, and some were preaching violent rhetoric, inciting people to violence. So James also condemned them because, according to James, evil that cannot repair evil. Injustice cannot resolve injustice, situation of injustice. James was reiterating the fact that one's actions necessarily prove their faith. And spiritual maturity can be observed in how one is controlling their tongue even when they are under unfair circumstances. And so, on the one hand, the two-part mes message, essence of James' message is oppression, condemning oppression and injustice, whether it comes from the rich or from the, from the oppressed who are responding to that. But James also showed us the appropriate scriptural response to oppression and injustice. James teaches us, and it's a principle that we hold even today, that in response to injustice and oppression, we have non-violent resistance. James doesn't say we should condole with it. He says we should resist, but we use all the non-violent means of resistance, which includes showing mercy to the oppressor. And I took time to make, put a footnote there that non-violent res resistance doesn't exclude the right of to self-defense. It doesn't mean uh, they were to allow themselves to be slaughtered. No. Far from me. So, with under this perspective, let's now go to our text today. Our text today is taken from the book of James, obviously, from chapter 3, verse 2 to 6. I read. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. So, James is including himself there. We all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. You see now, with what Paul was teaching in Ephesians chapter for, he says we need to get to perfection. And here's the perfection that James is talking about. He said if we control our tongues, we would be perfect. And we could also control our lives in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a sheep turn 
wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. Let's continue reading. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes great speeches, grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a world, a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by her itself. And I like what he said originally in James chapter 1, verse 26. He said, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. I like that. How about this other scripture in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21? It says the tongue can bring death or life, and those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Right? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. So we see now how important it is for us to control the tongue. Spiritual maturity is in our mastery of the tongue. Spiritual maturity, friends, is in our mastery of the tongue. Praise God for that prophetic word in tongues there that I hear. Now, so, so I think that the interpretation of that tongue would have been prosperous, pros, propent, how do we say that? It, it's, probably she's trying to tell us how can we attain maturity or control the tongue? How can we control our tongue? If I hear clearly what that prophetic word is saying, I think this is time for us to ask ourselves, pause and ask ourselves. So it's important to control the tongue, but how can we do it? Okay, let's do that. Let's see how we can answer that. The first thing to do is that think before you speak. If you want to control the tongue, the first thing we should do is think before you speak. Oh, I like Proverbs 29, verse 20. How many of you love Proverbs? It says, there is more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. More hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. I like this illustration. Listen to this illustration. A very striking statement that I read. It says, mistakes of the tongue have destroyed more people, ruined more marriages, and cause more businessmen their jobs and their futures than any other kind of mistake. Mistakes of the tongue. So think before you speak. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at five think filters. Some things that you could filter out when you are thinking. Before you speak. These are five filters that you can filter out. you got to ask yourself, is what I'm trying to speak now is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If you filter up, try to filter up all the thoughts that are coming to your mind before you speak through these five filters, it might be very helpful to control what you speak. Hmm. Now, another category, this lesson today, this teaching today is very, very practical. It gives you nugget. It doesn't just tell you what to do. It tells you how to do it. The next thing is eliminate the big six. Eliminate the big six. What are the big six that we should eliminate? The first one is lying. In America, we lie. There's a statistic that went out says that the average person lies 250 times a day. The average person lies 250 times a day. Wow. Now, you can say, well, I lie only maybe for 10, 10 times a day. Then, well, there are some that lie 500 times to make up for your, <laughs> for, 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 for your limitation in lying. You know, there are some things we say. I'll call you. Yeah, 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 we should get down for coffee one of these. Yeah, 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 I'll call you. I'll call you. You're not calling. I'm praying for you. You're not praying. They are not going to pray. If you think that they are, when it's my thoughts and prayers are for you, if you think they're going to pray, that's all the prayer. That's it. They have just said, my thoughts and prayers are for you. 
That's it. Yeah. If you think they're going to find some other time to pray your kidney, lying, lying, lying. What the Bible says about lying. The Lord detests lying lips, but delights in those who tell the truth. He said, don't say anything. It's just, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you're not going to do it, just, just tell the person that I, I cannot do it. Don't say, oh, it's a good idea. I'm going to call you. We should get together. You have no plans. Even at that moment, you know there are no plans of getting together. But we will not be frank on that. The second thing we want to move, the big six that we need to eliminate, the second one is what? Cursing. Cursing. Colossians 3 verse 8. Say, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. I like this illustration of a farmer. The farmer was known for his bad language. And in the village that he was, the many parents kept their children away from him because of possible intoxication. One day he was invited to church and he accepted Christ. A journey began in his life where his language began to change. Until one day he remarked, the farmer himself remarked, he said, I have been changed so much that even my horses don't understand me anymore. The things I used to say, they, he's not saying them again to the extent that even the horses didn't, were not understanding him anymore. What does that tell us? When Christ comes into someone's heart, there's often a change, a beginning of change in their vocabulary. Their vocabulary begins to change. There are some words that cannot come out of your mouth anymore. There are some things you can't say. Okay? Cursing. What about case joking? Case joking. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 4 says, Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or curse joking, which is out of place. They rather thanksgiving. You know what I used to be. I, I love jokes a lot when I, you know, when I was growing up, still in the world. I love to make jokes, curse joking. You know, somebody will say something funny, and I will say, "I nearly had a heart attack." But those kind of curse joking is no more there. These are things that should be out of. They are out of place. The Bible says these are out of place. These kind of things should not be coming again from your mouth. Increasingly, they should be less and less. What about flattery? We're looking at the big six things that you, we should eliminate from our speech. Flattery. Romans 18 verse 16 verse 18 says, For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ by their own appetite. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. We should keep flattery aside. If somebody asks you for their honest opinion, make sure you inquire from them if, it is, if they want an honest opinion. Tell them the truth. Do you like my hair? Well, I will go back and say, well, do you really want my honest opinion or you, 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 you're fishing for a compliment? You need to be clear on that because if it's my honest opinion, I might well, speak the truth in love, right? Well, I don't quite like your hair the way it looks now, right now. You know, I, I liked it better the way it was before. But who knows, this thing can grow in me. I could change my mind. But see, the bottom line is, do you like it yourself? You should be comfortable with what you like. Okay. Don't tell. He says flattery. We should watch against that. Also. What about gossip? This one, some of the big six, right? Talking behind somebody. Proverbs 29, 19, 20, 19 say, A gossip goes around telling secrets. So don't hang around with chatterers. Someone who tells you other people's secrets, obviously, is going to tell yours to others. What about taking the Lord's name in vain? Taking the Lord's name in vain. Exodus 20 verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Hallelujah. So, avoid, let's try to work on this. And you're not going to get it all right tonight. Okay, you're not going to get it right today. 
It's a journey that we're going to be doing recursive. If you, 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 you fall, you wake up and make the determination to press on. After eliminating the big six, what are we supposed to be speaking then? Because you might say, Pastor, you just you very you are silencing us. So after we stop doing curse joking, we have no slander, no this, no this. So we're gonna become dumb and deaf. What should we be saying? God is not that dumb. He knows what you should be saying. This is something you should replace this big six with. Let's look at what are the things. He says you should speak life. Speak words of life. Speak words of life. I like Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Say, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Say, soft word, what turns away wrath, right? So we should speak words of life. And I like this illustration. You better listen to this illustration. A group of frogs were traveling through the woods, and two of them fell into a deep pit. Two frogs fell into a deep pit. All the other frogs gathered around the pit. And when they realized how deep the pit was, they made up their mind that they had lost their two friends. They are dead. So the two falling frogs who were in the pit there were told to just lie down and die. There's no need. There's nobody can help them. They, they who are out cannot help them. They who are inside cannot help themselves. So they keep telling them, just die. You are as good as dead. Die, 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 die. Stop, stop. But while they were trying to push them down, that they should just sit and die, these two falling frogs ignored their comments and were trying to jump out of the pit with all their might. They kept trying to jump and fall back. Jump and fall back. And these ones outside will keep telling them, die, die, it's needless. Stop wasting your time. Just die, okay? Finally, finally, one of the falling frogs took heed to the advice that was being given by those up there, saying that they should just lay down and die. So he stopped trying and just lie down and die. The other one continued jumping as hard as he could. And in spite of the, 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 the yelling that was coming from on top, they stop, stop the pain, just die, stop the pain, just die. He kept trying harder and harder and harder, and finally he made it. And when he got out, the other frogs asked him, did you not hear us yelling at you to die? Yes, what this frog explained to them. He said, I'm deaf. All along I was hearing the noise, I thought you were encouraging me all the whole while. I thought that you have been encouraging me all the long, all the while. Yeah. What does this story tell us? Two lessons. There is power. The power of life and death is in the tongue. An encouraging word to someone who is down there can lift them up and help them through the day. An encouraging word. But a destructive one would be hidden like the one of the other frog, frog who had that destructive word. Just lie down and die. There's nothing you can do. So we can all choose to either speak words of encouragement or speak death to people. But the Bible encourages us to speak life. Mm -hmm. And I want to stand on this point and actually speak to some of us. The greatest the, the, the the, the dream that is in each one of us can either die or see the light of day through the words that those who are closest to us are saying to us. Now, we may not necessarily speak a word of death to someone who is close to you, but you fail to say the word that will encourage them. It's, you are also in the same category. Failing to encourage someone. Failing to say you are great. I, I love you. I admire you. I'm proud of you. Failing to say that will have the same effect. Like, because there are other voices that the person is probably hearing. Voices of the enemy of their soul who is telling them you can't amount to anything. You will never do anything. If the only voice that someone would hear is the voice of the enemy, then you who is failing to bring the word of life is accomplice. It's an accomplice to that. Because you didn't silence that voice. You didn't help them to hear another voice. So we should be speaking life. We should be telling our people, the people around us, encourage them. 
Don't see your, your brother is doing something good. You, you keep quiet. You say you love him. You don't love him. If you love him, you tell them that that is great. Amen. You tell them. Being silent, you are contributing to their failure. You want them to fail. Whether you like it or not, that's what you're doing. You never was on the path of those who were supporting them to achieve their dream. Let's do that, please. Let's also speak kindness, right? Speak with kindness. Proverbs 16, verse 24 says, Kind words are like honey. They are like honey. Sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Oh, I like the illustration of a general of our army. General Robert Lee. Robert Lee was once asked what he thought of a fellow officer in the Confederate Army. An officer was made some mean-spirited remarks about Colonel or General Lee. Now was Lee's moment. He was being interviewed. They asked him, what do you think about your colleague? What made those mean-spirited statements about you? Lee thought for a moment, then rated his colleague as very satisfactory. What? The person who asked the question was troubled. Say, but General, I guess you don't know what he has been saying about you. General Lee said, oh yes, I know, I know. But I was asked my opinion of him, not his opinion of me. You asked me to give my opinion of him which is very satisfactory. You didn't want me to re regurgitate his opinion of me, right? What do we learn there? What do we learn there, friends? Speak with kindness. It doesn't matter because it, it is carnality to say because he has bashed you, he has ruined your reputation, so the right thing for you to do also is to ruin their reputation. That's what we see in our political space in the country, isn't it? People are shaming each other on Facebook, on, on Twitter, and all this place. Shaming each other. Response to that is shame, 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 shame. Can we make a difference? Kind words really do matter, friends. Kind words do matter. Look at what happened in Germany during the Second World War. Do you know that for every word in Adolf Hitler's poisonous book, Menka, for every word that he said there, it cost the life of 125 people. Every word, bitter word that Adolf Hitler mentioned in that book, Menka, it caused the life of 125 people. Friends, I'm about ending my message today. I want to encourage you today to delight, to praise, to uplift, not to destroy. These are words that should come into our vocabulary. If you're not yet doing it, please, can you endeavor to use these words, please? Please, excuse me. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm proud of you. I'm praying for you. I love you. These are things that we should, these are words that you come more, more and more, more and more. And indeed, we see it in the Western world where we are, we see it quite a lot. People will tell you, that, I'm sorry. They have not really done anything wrong to you yet. But they, they have just had the reflect to say, I'm sorry, but we don't see a lot of it in the church. In the body of Christ. Hallelujah. We were supposed to be custodians of life. Let's do more. Hallelujah. Amen. Finally, speak encouragement. I've said that already. First Thessalonians 5 11 says, So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Final illustration for today. William Otto Ward once said this. He said, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I, will, I may never forgive you. Encourage me, and I will never forget you. Be an encouragement to someone. They will never forget you. If you want to leave a lasting impression on anyone, be an encourager. Hallelujah. Amen. Be an encourager. That's our message today. Our words matter. And when we start doing all of these things, it will be clear that you have attained spiritual maturity. And people will want to desire what you have. They will come to you. They will always want to be around you. My wife mentions that most of the time, that most of her, her, the, the workers she works with, they like to be around her. They like to come. Or her, or her colleagues like her company. I believe it's partly because of words of encouragement, words of kindness. 
words of life that you speak to his people. That's, are you going to do that today? And for those of you listening to me online today, who has not yet accepted the love of Christ, God loves you so much. Jesus Christ loves you. He has already paid for all your sins. He has given you a beautiful brand life that you don't have it yet. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? My question to you today is, what are you waiting for? Today you can make that decision. We are not asking you to do an uphill task. We are not asking you to go to the cross. We are not asking you to give away your money. We are not asking you to resign from your job. We are just asking you to accept the love of Christ. That is in Jesus Christ. And if you want to do that today, you can pray this prayer that is on the screen. You can pray and receive Christ in your life. And begin a tremendous life of victory, of help, of provision, of grace. And of eternity with God when Jesus shows up. Hallelujah. Amen. If you pray that prayer that is on the screen, let us know. We want to be come alongside you. We want to be encouragement to you. On that note, I just want to pray for all those who are listening to us online and we're going to separate with them in just a moment. But I speak the blessings of God upon your life. I pray and I declare that the words that you hear today, those words will defy your spirit. Those words will give you a life and a hope. And that you begin to walk in divine help, in divine prosperity, in divine provision, and your steps will continually be ordered in the Lord. I pray and I love you. And I pray that the love of Christ will be revealed in your life. And that you'll be a blessing for those of you needing healing. That the Lord will touch you wherever you are. Whether you're in a hospital bed, the love of God will touch and heal your body. And heal your mind. Will restore your marriage. Will bring back your children. Will improve your finances, your businesses. And things will begin to go well with you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I will look forward to hear again from you. And talk to you again. Come back next week. Check us out. Follow the next slides that are giving more information about our ministry. And it was a pleasure having you. God bless you. Bye-bye.